So as some of you know, I like to blog, and so I need a photo for the trip report that I'm going to write about my visit here today. So um, if you don't want to be in this photo, just cover your face. Otherwise, smile, selfie time. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk today about learning to code. And I think that, as Michael said, this is, this is a, some of the stuff that I do, but it's some of the stuff that I think is most important today um, in a lot of the things happening in the world. And so I want to give, give my attention to this topic and try to give you a sense of how I'm thinking about learning to code in society today and how people um, in the world are thinking about it, too, and some of the tensions between my perspectives and, and others. Um, so a bit about myself um, to, to go deeper. Um, I've been a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle for about 10 years now, um, tenured, and I did my PhD at Carnegie Mellon at the HCI Institute. And for context, um, I was part of the third cohort there. And so figuring out what a PhD in HCI even meant at the time was still an un undetermined question. And so it was a lot of fun to be part of that formative uh, first couple of classes at CMU. Um, and then I have a very interdisciplinary background. I studied computer science and psychology as an undergraduate. I took a lot of design courses when I was a PhD student. And I've continued to try to pick up new disciplines and new backgrounds. And I've lately been reading a lot about learning science um, as part of that. And so I tend to think of myself as somebody who really is um, a breadth-wise scholar and not, not necessarily going deep into a discipline. Um, but I do that from the perspective of thinking about what code is. So um, here's the perspective that I start with in my work. I think, as an HCI researcher, of code as the most powerful interface that we've ever invented. But it's also the least usable interface that we've ever invented. It's the hardest thing to use, to create, to express. Right? Um, it's a lot easier to go open up some Adobe product and do some graphic design than it is to go write some software to do what you want. Um, and I, I kind of sort of think from a justice perspective that everybody that wants to be able to harness this power should be able to harness it. It's something that we should allow people to do by lowering barriers barriers whenever possible. Um, but there really are immense barriers to doing this. And so when I was a PhD student and for the first several years of my faculty um, career, I spent a lot of time trying to lower these barriers by creating new developer tools and other kinds of technologies that would make it easier to express, easier to debug, easier to test, verify all of these activities, um, and I thought that that was sort of the most powerful way for me to spend my time, was creating technologies that would, would lower barriers. Um, what happened was I took a small leave and started a company and ended up actually engineering um, and, and managing um, a lot of engineers. And I realized something that was sort of evident every day, and that's that skills are just more powerful than tools. What human beings can do and, and what kinds of insights they have about how to solve problems, they're the things that drive our use of tools. It's not the other way around, right? So um, the kinds of things I saw, tools were amplifying people's abilities. If they knew what they were doing, they could harness tools to do amazing things. If my engineers had no idea what they were doing, tools just derailed them. They ended up somewhere that was unproductive. Um, and if we want people to have skills, skills come from learning, learning comes from teaching, and as a result, as a manager of engineers, I spent most of my time teaching skills. That was my primary job as a chief technology officer. And that was a really pivotal idea for me um, in sort of rethinking my own scholarship, because it meant that tools were not really the objective or, or the powerful uh, agent of change in the work that I was doing, but rather um, skills and, and all of the problem solving behind it. That's what I actually needed to develop if I wanted to lower barriers to harnessing that power of code. So at the exact same time that I was having this realization, the world also decided that this was a skill everybody should have. Right, so all of the things that happened on the left and are happening now, uh, code.org, for example, reaching its 500 million uh, learner milestone for um, the types of learning that happens in Hour of Code. The president, our former president, saying everybody should learn this or everybody that wants to should learn this. These are really powerful societal changes. And they're not just in the United States. They're all over the world. And then most recently on the right, we have a fairly significant investment by industry saying this is something that we want people to have access to as well. So while I was realizing that this was important to me as a scholar, the world was deciding this was important uh, sort of economically and from a justice perspective. And so this was really the right time for me to, to make that pivot and think about these problems. Um, and so the first question that I asked um, myself was, is any of this working? What, what do we know about um, whether learning is happening? And we have some evidence. It's not great, so feel free to pick it apart as much as you want. But this is, this is the sort of converging ideas that we have around um, the evidence. Here's some evidence from code.org itself. Um, 
about 77% of the people who've done uh, interactions with its Code Studio environment complete somewhere on the order of zero to two puzzles, and these are very, very simple puzzles. So if learning is happening, not much is happening, right? There's not a lot of engagement here and not a lot of activity. Um, if you look at AP computer science in high schools in the United States, there's record enrollment in APCS and its companion APCS principles, um, but most don't take the exam, and about 60% of who, uh, who do fail the exam, meaning they get a score of a one or a two, and the failure rates are even higher for underrepresented minorities. So there's some more data that whatever we're doing in these high school classes kind of isn't working and the failure rates are much lower uh, than other AP subjects. So that's high school. If we look at college, which is where a lot of the research has been, and I'll, I'll talk about that shortly, um, most undergrads, if you really go to systematically measure what students after a year of CS courses can do, they can't do much. They can't predict the outcome of a simple program. Um, they can't really solve simple programming problems. Um, the knowledge they have is very, very brittle. And the reason that we often don't notice this is because we only pay attention to the students that finish, right? There's all of this dropout and attrition. There's the students that get an A in the class, but because our assessments aren't very uh, valid or robust, we don't see that they're failing or that their knowledge is brittle. So there's this sort of hidden masked problem in the undergraduate setting uh, that we don't often think about or talk about. And then finally, when you look at uh, coding boot camps, which are this new phenomenon from the past few years, uh, there were 23,000 adults um, last year that, that enrolled in these. Um, about a quarter of those reported their dropout rates, and the dropout rates range from 10 to 50%, and most of them are on the higher end. And so when you look at a lot of the experiences that students are having here, they're finding that they don't believe they can learn this material. They're not getting feedback that they can, so they leave. Um, so these are all of the settings in which this learning is happening. Most of them we're seeing the same things. It's hard material to learn, and teachers don't really know how to teach it. Um, the last stat here that's sort of the most concerning is that there have been some recent surveys around how software companies think about the skills that um, graduates have. And about two thirds of them say that entry level developers, they'll hire them you know, because they, can't, they don't have any other options, but they generally don't have the basic programming knowledge that they need to be productive in a company. Um, and not even just from a sort of soft skills, software engineering perspective, but even just basic understandings of how programming languages work, how software is architected, and so on. There's a gap there. Um, so I did some more reading on why all of this failure might be happening. I read all of the seminal literature in learning science and education, and I read 30 years of computing education research to try to understand what these papers have to say about this, and these are some of the venues where that's published. And if you distill it all down, um, I think most people in the field that publish this would agree that there are six problems here, probably more, but the six major ones. One, people really do find computing very boring very solitary and very unwelcoming in most of the settings in which it's taught. Two, people struggle to learn their first programming language, and if they don't get past that, they don't really move any further past that. Um, people struggle to solve programming problems. They don't have a process for solving problems, and nobody really teaches the process. Um, teachers struggle to teach these things, um, and perhaps the most surprising is that number five, most teachers, when they struggle to teach them, they don't blame themselves, they blame learners. They say that learners must be broken in some way. There must be some people that know how to code and some people that don't. So let's just focus on the ones that are succeeding. And then finally, um, because of all of these things, most uh, learners lose confidence and give up. And this happens over and over again in all of these different settings in which people are trying to learn. Um, and, and these are big, nasty, gnarly problems. They happen probably on this campus. They certainly happen on our campus at the University of Washington. They happen in the 25 coding boot camps all around the Puget Sound that we've, that we've looked at. Um, and now they're going to happen in high schools, middle schools, and K through, K through 5 settings. Right? So this is not just a problem of higher ed anymore. It's a problem in this country for all forms of education and in the rest of the world. So in reducing this down and trying to focus, some of my goals have been trying to look at these problems of learning programming languages and programming process. Uh, I think there are challenging things in the socio-cultural aspects of learning that, that I'm not well equipped to answer, and I think that we have a lot of great people in the field that are tackling those. I wanted to focus on the ones that I had expertise on, and that really was the learning of this content. So I want to talk about that in the rest of this talk and try to figure out why are they hard and what are some effective and equitable and scalable ways for people to learn these skills that move beyond some of the ways that we do this this teaching and learning now. Um, so I'll talk about 
why learning is hard and give some instances of studies we've done recently that kind of uncover some, some facts about this. Um, I'll talk about how to make programmers, programs easier to read and how to make programs easier to write and share some new theories that we have and some studies that kind of test and validate them. Um, okay, so why is learning programming, learning to program um, so difficult? Um, I've done a lot of ways uh, to look at this problem. One of them is just by engaging deeply with people who are learning. Uh, this is a group of, um, of students that I taught a couple of summers ago through our Upward Bound program at the University of Washington. So these are all first generation college students who had some curiosity about, about programming and learning to code. And I just engaged with them deeply and, and mentored a lot of them. And over the past couple of summers, I've worked with about 70 of them. Um, most of them in Seattle are uh, refugees from other countries that have just arrived in Seattle. Um, and some of them are, are locals, but most of them are refugees. And um, some of the things that we found, this is just highlights, many teens lacked feedback or support about their learning from teachers uh, or from anybody else. Um, so here's a quote, um, he doesn't spend much time with me to be able to understand my problem in the class or, or help me on it. Throughout the AP class, I'd cry myself to sleep in silence without letting my older brother know my struggles. Right? So this brother was the one that encouraged him to take the class in the first place and then he provided no support. So that's an experience, right? Uh, some teens actually had productive informal mentoring relationships. They, these mentors provided encouragement and instruction and guidance and feedback. And all of that was associated with higher um, interest in learning to code. And this was independent of gender or socioeconomic status. So there was this really interesting relationship between just having one person that encouraged your learning um, to keep somebody engaged um, over time. And they, they really sought teachers and mentors who wouldn't judge them for their failures, who would inspire them to learn, who uh, had the expertise to actually guide them um, towards developing new skills. And um, these are really sort of common things amongst most kinds of learning and education. I think we often just forget them um, when we talk about computing. Um, another setting that we've looked at is boot camps. And so one of my students, Kyle Fair, um, did an interview study with um, uh, recent graduates or dropouts of 26 different coding boot camps in the Puget Sound region. Um, and he found a couple of interesting things about the experiences there. Um, some, bo some boot camps were very inclusive and encouraging, very intentionally so, um, but others were, were not. And they offered no instruction or feedback. So here's a quote. Uh, so they're trying to get you into this mentality of you have to read all the documentation. They sit in the background to let students read it. And what annoys me is that I paid a lot of money so that somebody could teach it to me. So they weren't here to just read API docs, right? They were here to help somebody instruct them through them. Um, other boot camps offered some unwelcoming culture that we might all be uh, familiar with in other settings, um, especially for learners without prior knowledge. Um, Here's a quote, it was divided, the class. Those with experience, I think they were looking down at those of us without experience because maybe there were certain things we were supposed to know that we didn't, right? So these are other sociocultural factors in kind of shaping whether somebody felt included and encouraged. Um, we've also looked at things less empirically and more analytically. Uh, we took a look at 30 coding tutorials, and this is a student I've worked with, a doctoral student, who didn't know how to code but wanted to learn, so we had her go and use the 30 most popular coding tutorials on the web to see how much she could learn and then analyze it from a learning um, perspective. So we kind of looked at four learning science principles. Um, these tutorials should connect instruction to prior knowledge, uh, organize declarative knowledge, right, facts about programming languages and other things, offer personalized feedback on practice, um, and foster some self-regulated learning in the problem solving that it was asking people to do while they were writing code. Um, so the student, Ada, she completed all of these tutorials, analyzed every element of their, her experience against all four of these, and found that most of these tutorials don't do any of these things. Right? And not surprisingly, the small number of studies that we've looked at um, for the learning outcomes of these tutorials show that most, mostly no learning happens. Um, you can get this great experience of having been exposed to coding, but Mostly, people can't do anything after they've finished this. So synthesizing this, why is it so difficult? Um, few of these contexts actually teach programming. Uh, there are many opportunities to read and write code in all of these settings, right? You get, you get exposed to it, you encounter it, but learners really receive very little feedback on whether they're reading it correctly or they're writing it correctly. Um, it's almost as if we expect learners just by exposure to be able to infer everything they need to know about how to write programs. And, and, and it shouldn't be surprising that since they've received no instruction on it, that they don't. They don't actually make that inference. 
So um, the first half of things I want to present around interventions for this is about reading. And I want to talk about what reading code is about and try to theorize about that and talk about some of our efforts to teach it. And then we'll do writing and then I'll wrap up. So um, here's why most people think um, understanding programs is hard. Um, and these are sort of the theories that have existed for several decades. A lot of people think that we just have the wrong programming language. If we redesign languages, then reading will be easier, and um, that's the solution to all of our problems. Um, others have talked about having the wrong environment, the wrong tools. If we redesign those, maybe everything will be easier too. Um, scarily, some people still believe in biology and biological explanations. They believe that there are some people that have a geek gene uh, that allows them to read code effectively and other people don't have that gene and we just have to decide who has that gene by making really hard midterms and final exams and we'll figure it out, right? Uh, there's no evidence for any of these theories, so um, I'm not saying they're wrong, but we certainly don't know that they're right. Um, and so really where I'm starting from is saying that the theories that we're just teaching it wrong, right? That's what's made these things hard. We need to find better ways of explaining how to read programs. And so um, here's a definition that I'll propose um, sort of theoretically. I'll claim that knowing a programming language means two things. Being able to reliably and accurately predict some arbitrary program's operational semantics. What will it do? What will the program do um, without the aid of some other environment to actually execute the program? That's what knowing how to read a program means. Um, and then secondarily, you have to know how all of those semantics map onto syntax, right? Because that's the notation that we use for expressing semantics. Um, it's a pretty basic definition of, of that knowledge, but it's tied to programming languages in a way that really other theories haven't been. Um, and note that I'm sort of ignoring all of the other things like design patterns and architectures and tools. There's a lot of other stuff you have to know to write programs. Um, I'm just talking about reading them right now. So here's an example of what it means to know an if statement in JavaScript. You have to know that first, this condition is evaluated. Second, if it's true, then the things in the first pair of curly braces happen. And if it's not true, then the second thing um, happens. And there's this other critical knowledge that um, if the else branch is true because the expression is false, then the then branch doesn't execute, which is a thing that a lot of beginners don't understand. They think that it's just going to be sequential because that's how well other reading works, right? Um, so understanding those semantics is really key. Uh, knowing a whole language like all of JavaScript means knowing all of the semantics. So in JavaScript, for example, there's about 90-ish non-terminals in the grammar that map onto all of these semantic nuances. Knowing the whole um, semantics of JavaScript means understanding all of those non-terminals and their semantics. And yet most intro programming classes, most tutorials, most coding boot camps never teach any of these things. In fact, I looked at our recent version of our CS1 course at UW. The first homework assignment is to write a Java program that has function declarations, function calls, string literals, string concatenation, and the semantics of all of those things are never taught. Somehow students are just supposed to magically infer how all of those things work, right, through the process of writing a program. Um, We've looked at lots of ways in the community of teaching these things. I think it should be obvious that teaching people semantics through formal notations like this probably doesn't work, right? It doesn't teach syntax. It requires learning another notation to learn a notation. Um, explaining semantics via natural language doesn't work so well because that's um, ambiguous and there's a weak mapping to syntax. You can have people write programs and hope that they will somehow infer semantics through a process of debugging. That doesn't work so well. Nobody ever infers the semantics. You might even have people step through a program's execution. The challenge there is that um, this is always at the granularity of a line of code. You have to somehow be able to see everything that happens inside of a complex expression all at once, right? And, and again, people will not, will not infer semantics at that level of granularity. So how should we teach semantics? That's the big question here. Um, and the approach that I'm, that I'm going to take here is teaching a notional machine, some representation of, of how the program operates and executes. And so we'll show each step of the semantics and the explicit effects of that part of the program on state, on a program counter, on a call stack, on memory, um, and then map all of those semantics and those side effects to syntax so that learners create an association between the syntax they're seeing in the notation and the side effects um, that that program is having in its behavior. Um, so there's three ways that we've tried doing this. I'm going to give you a tour through them just so you can see different ways that this basic pedagogy manifests. The first one is Gidget. Um, and here the idea is 
take this cute little robot that has been dented and is broken, um, who cannot debug its programs and it needs your help, and frame coding is a collaboration between the learner and this robot, um, and give learner a sequence of debugging puzzles in which they encounter the semantics of the programming language by seeing a broken program and seeing how those semantics play out in its behavior. And then the goal is to guide learner's attention towards contextualized instruction about the programming language's semantics um, so that they can map those onto syntax and build that knowledge. Um, so here's, here's how it plays out. There's a splash screen, um, and they get to learn a little bit about the environment and see the story behind Gidget being broken and not being able to solve its problems. Um, and then there's a variety of panels here around uh, the code on the left and the runtime state on the right. Um, and then um, there's a test case on the bottom left that verifies whether the puzzle's been solved by just having a certain output and state be possible. And then all of this instruction happens down here in Gidget's thought bubble. And so over the course of 37 levels in this game, it teaches um, the 12 major semantics of the programming language um, and includes lots of formative assessments to verify that somebody understands them. So that's the overarching curriculum. Um, so we'll jump ahead to level 20. This is where they learn functions and function calls. Um, and here what happens is we have a lot of embedded instructions. So there's explanations about what functions are, what they're used for, why they're valuable. So there's a bit of semantics explanation there. Um, Gidget here is explaining um, the syntax and how that maps onto the semantics through this instruction. Um, as they execute the program step by step, it's like running through with a breakpoint debugger, but at the token level instead of the line level, and seeing every single one of those pieces of side effect from the program executing. And that green line underlines the part of the semantics that's being explained. So Gidget's job as they step through it is to say, what happened as a result of that part of the program executing? Building up that association between syntax and semantics. Um, and then in this case, um, uh, we're trying to expose them to function calls and, and how to call functions. And so Gidget points out where the functions are, are sort of listed. This is like an API documentation right here. And this gate has this open gate function that the program's trying to call. You might already notice on the top there that it's calling open fence instead of open gate. So it's a pretty simple defect in the program. We just want to guide the learner's attention to that. And so the learner's going to step through and see that it couldn't find a function called open fence. Um, and then they're supposed to see this association that is called open gate. And um, once they've recognized that there's this notion of, of name resolution, that the names have to match for the functions to be called, then they can go repair that defect, um, step through the program, and see it work correctly. So the general theme here is that learners are encountering semantics, right? It's actually not as aggressive as maybe our, our theory would, would recommend. It's just showing the semantics to them and hoping that they understand this association. Um, um, but what we found is that it actually works reasonably well. Um, there, we did four online um, controlled experiments with about 1,000 adult learners across all of these studies. Uh, we found that learning is twice as fast as in uh, the Codecademy tutorial for Python, and it's about twice as much for open-ended creative exploration. Um, there are levels that uh, involve assessments where we're asking learners to predict the output of programs, and including those assessments um, increases learning efficiency um, by about double. Um, we also found interesting design factors, like how do we get learners to pay attention to that instruction to, in, in Gidget's thought bubble? It turns out by just giving the robot eyes and having it use personal pronouns like I and you and we to try to establish that collaborative relationship, we redirected their attention towards that instruction rather than to other parts of the interface. And so trying to do that in an online environment was key. I mean, all of this has um, really rapid effects on attitudes as well. When you have adults, for example, play this for 20 minutes, they, their opinions about whether learning to code is easy shift from being, it's the hardest thing, I could never learn it, to that was fun, give me more, right? Um, how do I learn more? So it's a very rapid shift in attitude. Um, this has had some impact. So um, about 20,000 people have played the game so far. Uh, this directly informed the design of Code.org's Code Studio and a lot of the ways that they provide instruction. And um, it also directly informed the design of Apple's Swift Playgrounds, which is a similar environment for learning uh, the Swift programming language. Um, this second strategy was much more explicit. Rather than trying to uh, let learners encounter the semantics of a programming language, this strategy is around explicitly teaching those semantics and guiding somebody through that mapping of syntax to semantics. 
Um, so here the idea was create this an interactive textbook where uh, learners walk through step by step a program's execution and along the way we explain what's happening each step and then ask learners to predict for per certain parts of the program what will happen next. And the idea here is to sort of use a causal inference model where somebody sees this mapping between uh, this syntax um, executing with this side effect and then be able to build up that knowledge by having somebody predict what that side effect would be. So I'll show you an example of that. And we did this for JavaScript. Um, so this is the entire JavaScript semantics. Um, each ch chapter covers some of the semantics in JavaScript. Um, and it takes about three hours to go through this. And so the goal here is teach JavaScript in three hours and have that knowledge be uh, more robust than something you might learn in a 10-week course or a 15-week course. So it's basically divided into three sections. There's a lesson on the left that explains why in the world would you want to understand this part of the programming language at all? What is it for? Uh, the middle shows the program and its syntax and that links syntax to semantics. And then the right on state shows the program's runtime state but also explains the side effects of each instruction on that state. So here's how it plays out. Um, here's an if statement. It's describing what if statements are for. Um, and giving some example of the syntax, and um, then saying that we're going to step through a, an if statement and see how it executes. Um, this next button is moving through an execution trace of this program history, right? So you can see on the top, those little bubbles popping up and down. That's each individual step of this program's execution recorded and, um, and captured so that we can actually insert instruction into certain parts of the program's execution history. And then as they step through it, um, the state is saying things like, this is an if statement. It's used to perform some steps conditionally. The first step of an if statement is to evaluate its condition to see whether the step should be performed. And so they're reading side effects as they go along through this program's execution. And then they can also go reverse, because we have uh, a trace of the program's execution history. So if they miss something or need to see an explanation again, they can just step backwards, go back and see that instruction again, and then go forward. So it's a completely linear way of stepping through a program and understanding how it executes. Um, and then finally, it ties it back, and the lesson explains the side effect of the semantics and then gives more examples um, as, they, as they go forward. Um, then the last thing I said that they're asked to predict what will happen. So here's an example of somebody saying, well, what did the zero greater than 10 part of this example do? What will end up on the stack over here? This should be true or false. They click true, which was wrong, and it gave an explanation. And they realized why it was wrong and then chose false. And that was the resulting um, uh, of, of that operation. Right? So very granular explanation of exactly everything that's happening as the program executes. So what was the effect of this? Um, part of this was actually trying to build this. In the first place, we had to completely re-architect the language stack. We had to um, build a parser that would maintain provenance of the origins of all of the uh, tokens and, and parts of the grammar so that we could link that to runtime state. Um, we had to facilitate reversibility and embedded instruction in an execution trace. So if anybody knows anything about how you build a compiler, this is a completely different architecture for building a compiler to make this instruction possible. Right? Um, we also had to redesign the language grammar to facilitate more granular explanations of parts of the programming language as well. And the effect of it was um, when we ran a four-hour controlled experiment to have somebody, have students go through this, we had about 40 CS1 students who hadn't ever learned a programming language before. Um, and we measured learning with this uh, new validated assessment of CS1 outcomes. Um, the tutor led to 60% higher scores on this test compared to uh, the Codecademy uh, JavaScript tutorial. Um, and did that in um, about half the time as well. So very rapid learning in just a couple of hours for all of the JavaScript language semantics. Um, the most exciting thing is that um, we, in that small sample, we almost also saw an increase in their midterm scores that transferred to uh, Java, which is what our CS1 course is taught in. Um, so that was explicit instruction of semantics. Um, this last one I'll talk about is um, reminding the learner to follow the semantics, reminding that the semantics exist and having them have a strategy around um, using them. So my uh, newest student, Benji Shea, um, he started from this premise that when learners have really brittle knowledge of semantics, their strategy is often to just guess what the semantics are. Um, and then they use that to reason about how the program will execute. So he wanted to give them an explicit strategy for reading programs that prompted them to use their knowledge of the semantics in their reading of the code. Um, and that should outperform guessing. 
So the strategy was really simple. Um, this is the strategy. It was understand what you're being asked to do, find where the program begins executing, execute each line according to the rules of Java, and then there's this sub-strategy uh, from the syntax, figure out the rule, follow the rules, um, map the side effects of the rules, and then find the code for the next part that we'll execute. So really basic top-level strategy for how to read a program. And this is the result. Um, so they end up with this uh, program on a piece of paper, lots of annotations that follow that strategy. Um, and then the effect of this, um, as predicted, is, is pretty uh, powerful. So in just 15 minutes of practice of this strategy, uh, the 12 students who learned the strategy were more systematic than the 12 who didn't. They had 15% higher performance on some tracing problems we gave them in the lab, um, almost a grade point higher um, on the midterm that they took about four weeks later after this experiment. And in the experimental condition, none of the students failed the midterm, whereas 25% uh, of the control group participants did. So this really simple strategy of just 15 minutes of practice um, sort of transformed their ability to read programs. Um, so the synthesis here is when it comes to reading code and understanding what programs do, uh, requiring learners to directly observe the operational semantics of a programming language and map them onto syntax can really promote much better learning outcomes than we can otherwise. Now, I'm not assuming that they're going to infer these things on their own, but explicitly instructing on them is very powerful. Um, this, last half of, this last part of the talk is going to be about writing programs. We haven't made as much progress on this. I think it's a harder problem, um, but I want to talk about a theory that we have and an idea for how to, how to teach this more effectively. And so when we think about program writing, there's actually little work trying to figure out what does it mean to know how to write programs anyway? What is that skill? What is, what is that skill composed of? Most work kind of talks about the differences between experts and novices, shows that novices are sort of unsystematic and that they're speculative and that this is mostly ineffective. Um, there are a few papers that show that the most effective developers are better self-regulators, um, that they regulate their problem solving and, um, and that is related to more higher productivity. Um, so here's what this concept means. Um, it's basically a, a set of skills that you probably all recognize in yourselves as successful uh, people. Explicit planning skills, explicit monitoring of your process, um, explicit monitoring of what you understand and what you don't understand. Uh, reflection on your cognition, right, metacognition. Um, Self-explanation of the decisions you make. Why did you decide this? Why did you not? Um, all of these executive functions around better problem solving are generally uh, correlated with lots of better learning outcomes and better problem solving in lots of disciplines. The hypothesis is that this is true in programming as well. Um, and in fact, when we look at sort of um, in practice, one of the studies that we've done uh, from my former students, Paul Lee, um, he interviewed about 59 Microsoft um, senior developers and almost 2,000 um, in a survey. And he found that when developers reported what made somebody a great engineer, um, self-regulating, self-regulation skills were one of the top three attributes in, in what makes somebody a great engineer. So that skill seems to be an intrinsic part of writing code, writing great software. So um, my student Dost and I took this work and started theorizing about how is self-regulation related to, to writing software? How, what, in what way does it actually help somebody write code? So he talked about um, programming as, as involving sort of six core activities. Um, interpreting the problem you're solving, uh, searching for similar problems that, that might solve it, searching for solutions to those problems, evaluating those solutions, implementing them, and then evaluating the implementation. And note that writing code is, is just this one bullet here, right? Everything else here is actually about planning. Everything else here is about trying to reflect on decisions that you've made. And so his theory was that programming, what it really requires is a whole big repository of a whole bunch of patterns of solutions to problems and an understanding about the mapping between problems and solutions. And then the key thing is that self-regulation skills actually link all of these activities. They help you decide when to switch from one to the next. They help you decide um, when it's time to evaluate, when it's time to try rewriting something, and so on. And developing those skills is actually the challenging part of writing code. So the first thing he set out to do was find out if this was, was true. And so he um, looked at um, sort of a cognitive interview, a think aloud study with 37 novices that were in a couple of intro CS courses and had them write solutions to some programming problems. 
Um, and he found that most novices um, engaged in some degree of self-regulation, but most of it was infrequent or, or shallow or superficial in some way. They weren't very good at it yet. But when we looked at those who did it well, um, they were actually much more highly correlated with fewer errors in the programs that they wrote, um, only when they had sufficient prior knowledge. Right? If, they, if they had mastered the concepts in what we were testing and what problems they were solving, they, that those self-regulation skills were really powerful. If they didn't have that knowledge, it didn't matter how good they were self-regulating, they still failed. So that was pretty consistent with the theory that we had, we had developed. So the big question is here, can we actually teach these self-regulation skills? Because if we can, then everybody can be a better developer. They can write programs more effectively. So what we tried to do is we set up a two-week um, summer camp with 48 high schoolers. None of them had ever written any code before. Uh, we spent the first week teaching them HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript, and React. And for those who don't know what React is, it's not the easiest thing to learn. It's a pretty difficult abstraction to wrap your mind around. And so this was a strong test, right? We were trying to figure out how far can we get somebody with no knowledge of, of programming to go in two weeks. Um, so the treatment group received a couple of things. They learned about Dostanai's theory of programming. So they had explicit knowledge of how we believed programming worked and what was hard about it. And then critically, they received this intervention. And the intervention was any time uh, one of the high schoolers wanted help, um, before we would offer them help, we would ask them to say, um, what activity are they doing? Um, what was their strategy for performing that activity? And was their strategy working? And the purpose of that was to try to foster these self-regulating skills, to help them reflect on their planning, on their comprehension, um, on their strategies, and so on. And so um, in the control group, we would just help them immediately, like you would a TA in a class. right? So inserting this self-regulating prompting in, in this uh, protocol was the key part of developing this, this skill. So um, here's the outcome. Um, along four measures, um, there was great success. So the experimental group participants who got that prompting uh, accomplished more in that last week of class. So they completed not only more of the requirements that we had for the class, but they also defined the requirements of their own and completed more of those. Um, their self-efficacy was higher um, significantly over the last course of that week. These are longitudinal results. Um, on the bottom left, the green bars there are all of the self-defined requirements that students performed. Um, so they came up with more of their own requirements and, and finished them than the control group did. And then lastly here, I thought this was one of the most powerful things, is that um, this trend here of, of growth mindset, um, it actually declined in the control group over time, which is something that others have reported in higher ed settings as well. And that's really scary, the idea that learning to code in a certain way would make you believe that you can't learn things anymore, that's a scary outcome of a class. We prevented that erosion through these self-regulation prompting interventions. Um, so these are, these are really exciting results. That means not only can we teach some of these skills in a class and it can result in a very short time um, better outcomes from a learning perspective, but that we can actually help preserve some of these beliefs about learning future things. Um, that's really exciting. So when we talk about writing programs, um, really the lesson here is that teaching programming um, self-regulation skills really promotes important things like independence and increased productivity and higher self-efficacy. And these are key things that really don't appear in most of the other settings that we've uh, seen people learn to code in. So um, a couple of things about what's next, and then I'll open up for questions. Um, one of the observations that Benji's made um, in the lab is that a lot of our prior work shows increases in learning outcomes through a lot of these interventions, including some of the ones that I just showed you, um, but not really mastery, right? Um, most of the interventions we've had, learners don't 100% understand the programming language we taught them. They sort of understand it more than they would have without our intervention, but they haven't mastered it. They can't, give, can't take any program and read it perfectly. They can't write any solution to any problem. So how do we get to mastery? Um, a lot of times, human tutors can get us there because they can provide really rapid, immediate, personalized feedback around a lot of um, the conceptions that, that learners are starting with. But we can't really scale that very well. And so Benji's been working on a tutor that um, sort of provides an infinite amount of personalized practice by leveraging a lot of interesting new techniques from program synthesis, where what we're doing is we're taking our model of what somebody understands about a programming language and synthesizing the exact program that tackles whatever they don't understand about that program, programming language yet. Right? And the ability to actually create content like that is something that human tutors can do. Um, we're going to be able to do it at scale um, 
uh, with a lot of interesting new approaches to kind of monitoring and modeling people's knowledge. So the goal here is to try to have students master CS1 content in about 10 hours um, rather than 10 weeks. And I think that that's possible through better instruction and better feedback. Um, another uh, project that I'm working on with one of my co-PIs, Thomas Latoza at George Mason, um, and my student Das and I, is self-regulation, as we looked at, is only really useful with good strategies. It doesn't matter if you can decide you need to do something different if you don't have an idea of what that different thing is. And so um, we've been thinking about what are strategies? What are programming strategies? Um, how do we describe them? Which ones exist? Uh, when are they effective or ineffective and in what contexts? Um, how do we help people learn them and execute those strategies? Um, so in the same way that um, other engineering disciplines have engineering handbooks that kind of catalog all of the ways that you solve all of the major problems in, let's say, bridge building right, or architecture, um, we need something like that in software engineering to sort of catalog all of the strategies that guide solving all of the problems in software engineering. And if we can regularize that knowledge, I think we can accelerate how quickly people can learn and master all of those things about software engineering. Um, so we're really building a new science of, of programming strategies through that. And then lastly, um, with Mike Ernst uh, in CS and my student Kyle Thayer, we've been thinking a lot about what it means to learn APIs. What does it mean to know an API? What is that knowledge? What are the prerequisites for being able to use it productively and robustly? And so we're building a new theory of API knowledge is this combination of the domain concepts embedded in the API, the, the templates that drive uh, productive use of it, and some of the underlying semantics of how APIs execute. Um, and then the exciting thing is to try to take uh, source code for an API and automatically extract all of that knowledge. Because in some sense, APIs actually uh, explicitly represent all of the things that must be known about it um, in their implementation. So how much of it can we extract and build and synthesize instruction around um, automatically? And so here we're going for robust API learning at scale. So um, I think there's a lot of exciting stuff in this field. Um, the history here is that this is a field that's been around for a while, but really hasn't had a lot of attention or resources. Um, there are a lot of great faculty, like myself, that have started to work in this space um, uh, from other fields, like PL and software engineering and HCI. And I think it, as it's rapidly growing and the number of doctoral students is growing, um, it's time to resource it and really make it work, because we have approximately 500 million people who want to learn this. And it, it, with the status quo, about 500 million of them are going to fail to learn it. Um, so think about how to resource it. Think about hiring in this space. Um, I hope you'll join us. Thanks. We have questions. Uh, so I noticed your first project was like highly gamified, right? And like the, the other ones like looked more like you know like traditional educational interfaces. Yeah. Was there a particular explicit reason? But like, and I'm guessing like the gamification has like lots of boosts and engagement, all those good things. Like, is there a particular reason why like like you, they kind of like shifted in trajectory like that? Yeah, there's, there are particular reasons. I mean, I think that one premise that I start with in a lot of um, educational technology design is that all things, to some extent, are a game. It's just that they vary in how good of games they are. I would characterize, let's say, the programming language tutor that I showed as a very bad game, right? Its game mechanics are kind of boring. There's not a lot of positive reinforcement in the game, and you really need to bring a lot of motivation to it to stay engaged and successfully learn all of that material. In contrast, the Gidget game was designed to be an engaging game. That was the primary design goal of it, to get somebody through it, and to try to understand how design um, was impacting engagement and then led to learning. Right? So really, it was just different design goals for, for those two different environments that, um, that led to that. Um, when I think about sort of the design of pedagogy in general, I mean, I think about my own courses as, as games. When I describe a uh, syllabus to my students, I tell them the rules of the game. I frame the class as a game. Um, and I think that's just a, a way of recognizing that all of these rules around learning that we construct, all of these environments we create to promote learning, they are all artificial. Right? They're, they're not an authentic environment in which we're producing um, authentic things. And so recognizing that and just making that explicit, I think, can just be a powerful way of engaging people initially. Yes. Uh, great talk. Um, I was wondering, in, as you were talking in the later part of the talk and towards the future, one of the things that you, <clears throat> one of the things that you were talking about were strategies. And I'm wondering, you know, to me, it, it overlaps a lot with patterns and design patterns. And I, and I feel like you know, one of the techniques that we have now is just collecting those patterns 
and also creating pattern languages. And so I'm wondering, how do you see the difference between patterns and strategies, and what are some exciting things that you're thinking about moving beyond yeah. ways that we have of collecting these or helping people learn strategies? That's a great question. So let me give an example of a strategy that most of you who write code um, today have probably used. So what's a good strategy for trying to find um, the best design pattern, the best code to write to use an API? Well, you start um, by first trying to formulate what behavior you're trying to implement. Then you translate that behavior into some query to Google. And then Google does the work of trying to find the right 10 Stack Overflow articles for you. And then you read all of those Stack Overflow articles. And then you try to triangulate between all of the facts and um, sort of uh, fake news inside of them and infer the actual truth from those 10 so that you can actually write the behavior that you want, right? That's a strategy. That's a process that you can follow to arrive at some design solution to leverage an API. But we don't talk about those strategies as explicit things, right? We don't try to uh, define them, write them down. We don't try to teach people uh, any of these strategies. And so when they go off and try to solve a problem in a class or they're in a software company trying to implement or architect something, we just sort of pretend that everybody's skill set is that they can magically define their own strategies and that they will be efficient and productive because they can all define them. What I found as a CTO and as a manager of several engineers is that nobody had any of these strategies. They were all highly ineffective at solving problems and that when we would just share our strategies with each other, everybody became more effective really fast. The challenging thing, and I think this is the research question, is um, how do we represent them? Right? I just gave you some natural language representation of an API usage strategy. Um, is that sufficient for helping somebody productively learn it and execute it? Or do we need more robust support and scaffolding for learning those strategies? Those are some of the open questions that we're, we're dealing with. Yeah. What do you think is like the level of gain that comes from personalization versus just having like a really good teacher recorded like you can record a really good teacher, have a user board for questions, and that scales really big, really quick. Like what's the gain from personalization? Because I think like yeah. even in normal classes, <clears throat> if it's like a really big class, you don't get a lot of personalized time, yet students still kind of learn stuff. I mean, you ask friends, you Google. As long as the teacher is really good, you get like most of the stuff. Yeah. Well, so what you just said, that's where I'll pick up. You ask friends, you Google, right? Um, that's, that's a learner trying to get personalized feedback, right? That's, that's uh, somebody going out and seeking um, instruction from their peers. They're seeking validation of their, their concepts from other people that might have um, similar expertise or slightly greater expertise from them. One way or, another, or the other, if learning's gonna happen, that, that feedback and validation of whether you got something right or wrong, and, and if so, how, um, that has to come from somewhere. So when we teach a class of 100,000 people or 100 people or just 10 people, somebody's got to produce that for learning to happen, right? Um, sometimes a lecture can contain that because there's enough exploration of right and wrong answers that somebody can self-validate those things. Uh, sometimes a Stack Overflow article that has uh, 10 answers in it, nine of which are wrong, helps you see that space and kind of recognize um, whether your understanding was right or wrong. Um, but in, in my view, sort of all of these boil down to sort of key requirements for deliberate practice, right? That has to, there has to be feedback somewhere that responds to your conceptions. And if it doesn't, um, learning isn't gonna happen. Um, I think we just need to recognize how that manifests in the different learning settings that we talk about, right? As a manager, when I was teaching my engineers, um, it was very direct sort of tutoring based things. In a, a massive online course, um, it's probably going to be all of the sort of invisible study groups that happen and peer interactions that happen. But it's happening one way or the other. Yeah. Um, I want to push back a little on this idea of being able to master CS1 material in yeah. 10 hours. Yeah. Um, I'll just stipulate that maybe you can get people to read programs effectively and understand the semantics. Yeah. But what we're trying to do in CS1 is get people to be able to write programs at the level they'll need to do in subsequent courses. And certainly, you know, the last assignment yeah. in our course takes more than 10 hours, even for the best students. So what, what does it mean? Uh, in, uh, how could you master, or how could you know in 10 hours whether people have the ability to write a program 
that took longer than your course elapsed time yeah. to construct. I mean, I think you may be defining mastery in a different way than we do. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think there's three things that we can sort of surface to reconcile that conflict. Uh, one is the ridiculously provocative number that I used. Right? Yeah. Um, so we'll put that aside and just uh, let that be what it is, right? Uh, the second part at play, I think, is that um, we have ill-defined notions of what a CS1 class is even for. What is the what is the capacity of that course to promote learning, and how far can somebody go in it? Right? Um, I don't think we've defined that in many ways. We've we've desperately searched even for one CS1 class to have some well-defined learning objectives, but we just can't find any. We, all the faculty we ask, they have never really written them down. What do we want somebody to know in the class? It's not always that clear. So I think that there's varying notions of where, where we want learning to happen. Um, and then the third thing at play there is that my hypothesis around that small number of hours or the orders of magnitude number of smaller of hours is that the ways that we teach these things are so bad that there are big wins early on. Right? I just think that so much of what we don't teach is so critical to actually learning this stuff that the moment we teach it, even if we teach it um, poorly, that we're going to get orders of magnitude gains. And then from then on, we're probably going to be incremental. Right? So it's those big wins that my lab is going after right now, where we're trying to really understand what are the critical things that are missing from pedagogy to get those big wins. and then you know. I'll let other people optimize and other things, but I, I really think we want to reshape um, how it is that, that we teach it by trying to define what it is that we're teaching. Yeah. To, thank you for laying out strategies that will hopefully touch more and more lives in the future. What has been, in your experience and opinion, the biggest bottleneck in having that happen? Has it been research talent or funding or institutional buy-in? Can you restate your question? Tell me more about strategies that you want to know about? Well, uh, my question would be, what is, so for example, a lot of the machine learning algorithms yes. we use today were invented a long time ago. Right. It's simply with increasing computational power and also increased amount of data availability that we were able to use them. There, the bottleneck was those two things. Right. And what here is the biggest bottleneck in having these become more mainstream? Yeah, I think that um, in general, uh, all of this knowledge about computing, whether it's really basic concepts like some of the ones that I've talked about, all the way to advanced concepts like machine learning. Um, when I see, uh, when I, I sort of see structural bottlenecks in, in research, right? So I'll, I'll surface a couple that I think are important. Most people think of computing education research as sort of a backwater of both computer science and education, right? And so who wants to do a PhD in that? Who wants to do research in that? That's not something where you're going to build a reputation. That's not something where you're going to be able to sort of um, have great achievements, right? And so there's actually a, a whole uh, sort of under-resourced part of, of investigation and scholarship in that space that I think is holding back a lot of this. Um, and then in terms of actually disseminating it, right, this is something that's true for almost all academic disciplines. When we make these discoveries, how do we actually get these discoveries in the hands of people doing learning and people doing teaching? Right? That's a big challenge as well. So um, I've had to also tackle things like um, I'm sitting on the Washington State Governor's Board for a K through 12 implementation um, for uh, CS education, right? And having to work through all of the policy challenges and all of the teacher training challenges to try to just get some of these discoveries in the hands of teachers is its own challenging problem, right? And I think that we have to rethink as academics what our role is in doing some of that dissemination because it's not going to be the teacher going and seeking out a PDF on the ACM digital library that transforms their learning, right? We actually have to bring it to them and find the right representation for it too. And I think that's an equally important part um, on top of our discoveries. Yeah. On this last comment, so a lot of what you shared, by the way, great talk, great, um, great work. Uh, it's needed because for the last 30 years, folks like the person sitting right next to me has been saying a lot of these things, uh, like why is programming difficult? Syntax, semantics, pragmatics. It's all those things tied up. You know, um, not just Roy, but you know, Soloway and Dubele and Richard Mayer, etc. Have have sort of written all that from, you know, it's in education literature. And so I think I, I, I want to hear your thoughts on how to bring, you know, work in these interdisciplinary spaces where a lot of work is done 
in one discipline, but it probably is more meaningful to the computer scientists. And so, so how do we bring these disciplines closer together and sort yeah. of have people in computer science actually read that literature from 30, 35 years ago that sort of says all of this? And yeah. Um, I've talked to a lot of your great doctoral students this morning, and so, some of these issues came up around um, what does it mean to be a member of a community, a scholarly community? And I think that that's actually at the heart of, of you know, of what your question is, because I don't view my role as sort of just deepening some literature in some domain-specific education research um, uh, community, right? Part of my role is actually to bring it to other communities, too. My, my job is to communicate these things to computer scientists. My job is to communicate them to education researchers. And if my entire career ends up being a bridge between those two communities, and that's the function that I play in that, in that scholarly community, I'm actually OK with that. I don't need to have um, you know, bigger roles or larger roles. We all have some role to play in our disciplines. And none of us are going to completely reshape the disciplines on our own. Right? So for my students, I always try to help, help them think through what do they want their role to be in the next phase of their career? What role do they want to play in their community? And, and how can I position them to get to that place? And I think that's something for everybody to think about um, as they plan their studies. Time for one. Um, so I just wanted to call out um, one specific sub-problem of this, this really hard task that you described of writing a program. Um, and some people, I think, refer to this as like abstract thinking. Right? Um, and there's this degree of, of uh, or uh, algorithmic thinking, sorry. Um, but that, that sort of abstract reasoning uh, is hard because um, you know, we can't target it directly. It usually needs to be instantiated in some sort of problem. Um, and I found that this is often, in, in the friends that I talk to, the point of dropout is like, you know, my brain just doesn't think that way. I can't learn to think that way. Um, and so we can teach you know, operational semantics. We can teach mapping onto syntax. But what are the strategies that you've discovered for really getting someone to think algorithmically um, in that way. Yeah, um, I'll start with an important disclaimer, which is I don't think most of us understand much about that problem at all. I don't, there's not a lot of research on it. There's not a lot of literature talking about that in particular in computing or, or in learning a program. Um, I do think that the more basic discoveries we have suggest that some of the, some of the assumptions that we make about what knowledge will generalize are, are just not true. So let's, let's say um, you teach somebody uh, recursion, right, in Java. There's a hope amongst computer scientists that once they learn recursion in Java that they will know recursion in everywhere, right? That that will just immediately transfer to all possible settings in which recursion applies. That doesn't happen, right? And most of what we've seen in uh, learning science and education shows that transfer like that is really rare or never happens at all. And that um, if you want to do it, you actually have to build really intentional bridges from one context to another. Um, and so I think there are some basic beliefs about learning amongst um, computer science teachers and, and instructors that just are not true. They're just not, not true with respect to how we understand learning. Um, and, but if, if we take some of that prescriptive advice, like teach, teach recursion in Java and then teach it in 12 other languages, that might actually be a really powerful strategy. It's exactly what my programming languages teacher did. I feel like I understand recursion in at least 12 languages because she chose 12. <laughs> I could have understood it in 13 if she chose 13, right? Maybe I even understand it now in all of them because I could generalize across all of those different semantics, right? Um, so even transferring some of our basic understanding about learning to computer science would probably result in better learning in general. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time.